Hey guys, welcome to Foundflix and another edition of Ending Explained. This time we'll be looking at the Belco Experiment, a horror thriller that delves into what happens to a group of employees that are put into a high stakes survival situation and they are forced to kill others for their own survival. The movie explores how different personalities respond when their lives are on the line and it's pretty brutal for the most part. So we already know that this whole thing is an experiment, it's right there in the title. But to find out why it's happening and who's behind it, we'll have to dig a little bit deeper. All right, let's find out what the Belco experiment is really all about and look at where things might go after the ending that leaves us with a bunch of questions. First, let's learn about Belco itself. Belco Industries is a nonprofit company located in Caracas, Venezuela, and there are 40 such facilities across the globe. Technically, it is run by the US government, and the staff consists mostly of people not local to the area. The staff has been working there for about a year, and from what it seems so far, Belco is a pretty typical office setup. But things will be very different this day. Things are already a little off as the employees arrive and are greeted by heavily armed soldiers, rather than their normal security guards. But they chalk it up to something else going on in the area. Area. So the employees go on about their daily business and we are introduced to several members of the staff and their day-to-day -day interactions with each other. Most are friendly and it's clear they have some kind of relationship with their fellow employees. Honestly, there's way too many characters to keep track of in the movie, so I can't talk about every single one. But the most important ones of note are Mike and his girlfriend Leandra and the COO and boss Barry Norris. It's Mike and Barry's conflicting views over how to deal with the situation that much of the movie's conflict stems from. Also through Danny who is starting her first day at Belco, we learn that all the employees are implanted with trackers due to potential kidnapping threats in the area. But it's not a tracker at all, it's a bomb which plays an important part in the experiment. Then all of a sudden their seemingly normal day is turned on its head when giant metal impenetrable walls cover all the windows and doors in the building, trapping them inside. Then a mysterious voice comes over the intercom to announce they need to kill two of the employees or several more employees will be killed at random. The staff doesn't take it too seriously at this point, thinking it's some kind of prank and essentially ignoring the voice's instructions. But people soon start taking things much more seriously as after their time lapses, they prove they aren't blocked and a handful of employees are killed, their heads exploding because of the bombs implanted in their brains. At first it's believed to be from sniper shots, but then Mike realizes it's actually the bomb in his head. He tries to remove it with a box cutter in the bathroom, but the voice quickly returns and tells him to stop or they'll trigger his bomb. So we see that no matter where they are in the building, they are being watched. And I didn't even think about it until I'd seen it a few times, but even the logo for Belco Industries itself is an eye, and that is a big part of the experiment the observation. Mike stops his bathroom surgery and now that everyone is effectively rattled by what's happening, it's time for phase two of the experiment. This time the stakes are much higher. The voice says they have two hours to kill 30 employees and if they don't, they will kill 60 instead. That's a lot to ask, and it's this that starts to reveal the true nature of how people will act when forced into survival mode. When it comes down to it, would you be willing to kill someone else in order to survive? That's Norris's mentality on the situation. He's got a wife and kids and has to survive to provide for them. And so he's willing to consider the idea of choosing 30 to do so, so he can go home to his family. Meanwhile, Mike has a differing viewpoint and he wants everyone to survive. So he's not even willing to consider the idea of picking the 30. It's this humanitarian perspective he consistently has throughout the movie. Even in this scene, Leandra, who would be considered good, says we need to consider all options, like killing the 30, while Mike never budges on his feelings. As I said, he's the only one that doesn't devolve as a result of the situation. He is always trying to save everyone, no matter what happens. And it's this core disagreement over how to approach things that causes Norris, the crazy pervert Wendell, and some others to splinter from Mike and the rest. Mike's first plan is to hang banners on the side of the building to alert people outside about what's happening. Happening. But before they can even get the signs up, soldiers from below fire at them with machine guns and they are forced to abandon their plan. Unfortunately, Norris and his crew blowtorch their way into the armory, which is now overly stocked with guns thanks to their new gods, as Norris describes them. Now fully loaded, Norris gathers the group in the main lobby, separating them out into who will be killed. He picks elderly people and those without young kids, so he at least is still trying to maintain some sort of humanity. He doesn't want to just open fire and kill everyone, and still believes what he is doing is for the best. But there's not enough from what he picks, and so Norris has to go through the remainder to get to that total 30. And one of those that's chosen is Mike, who is lined up against the wall with everyone else. Norris's crew starts executing the group one by one, and just as Mike is about to be shot, Danny cuts the lights, causing chaos as everyone runs for their lives. Norris Norris and Wendell continue to hunt the group through the building, but when the time runs out, they only killed 29. One less than the 30 the rule stated. So close. 
So it's time for more exploding heads as tons of people are taken out by their brain bombs and only a handful of employees are left after this purging. Now the voice tells them it's time for the final phase, phase three. The rules are simple this time, whoever kills the most people is the one who gets to leave. This final fight for survival destroys everyone's remaining shred of humanity except might, as they are now completely out of options. Killing others is the only way to survive. Around this time, Mike encounters the stoner Marty, who is screenwriter James Gunn's brother. He was also in Guardians. Marty has been going around to the bodies, scavenging and collecting the undetonated bombs in their heads. Marty ends up getting killed in this scene, and Mike takes the napkin full of bombs with him. Meanwhile, Norris, who currently has the most kills by far, is on a killing spree, taking everyone out that he encounters, including Danny, which was kind of a bummer. Now only Leandra, Mike, and Norris are alive, but Leandra is bleeding out from a gunshot wound. They hide from Norris in a filing cabinet and Leandra dies. Her death is what pushes Mike over the line and finally forces the violent side out of him that he had repressed so far. He brutally attacks Norris with a tape dispenser, bashing his head in. So with Norris dead, Mike is the final surviving Belco employee and the winner, so to speak. All of the metal doors and windows roll away from the building and guards appear, escorting Mike outside into a hangar next door. Here Mike finally meets the man behind the voice. He reveals himself to be a social scientist who believes researchers need to see people unfettered or unrestrained in extreme environments in order to make new discoveries about human nature. The voice then tries to ask Mike some standard questions about the experiment and how he's feeling right now. But Mike isn't too interested in answering any of their questions and it's clear furious at what he's been put through. He notices a switchboard nearby labeled with every employee's names and this is what was used to trigger various employees brain bombs. It turns out that Mike planted the leftover bombs he got from Marty and placed some on the soldiers when he was being taken to the hangar and onto the voice himself. He leaps up, flipping all the switches, except for his own. The bombs go off, taking out the soldiers and wounding the voice. Mike grabs a gun standing over him. The voice pleads with Mike not to shoot him and says that Mike values human life. Mike responds to this by shooting the voice repeatedly, killing him. So we see what it takes to be a winner in the experiment. It's the one who values humanity idealistically rather than one's own selfish desire to survive. But Mike's value for humanity has been broken through the experiment and now he is a remorseless killing machine. He then steps outside confused about what to do next and the shot pulls out to a security camera watching Mike, then we see more and more monitors of other survivors from Belco facilities across the globe. And then another voice declares, it's time for phase two. So obviously the entire Belco Industries was just a facade for these inevitable experiments around the globe. The scientists select these people of different personalities and background and put them into employment at Belco. Then they wait a year so the employees can develop some kind of personal attachment to each other before finally starting the experiment. So who are these scientists working for. I think it's safe to say they are somehow involved with the US government. We find out early on that Belco is indeed controlled by our government and it makes sense that they would be behind an experiment like this. It's interesting to consider as when we see the other final survivors on the screens, they are completely alone. No soldiers or anyone else around. So it seems that the last one standing meeting the voice and the scientists is actually the final part of the experiment. How will the survivor react when they learn what they went through was all for an experiment? We see Mike takes them out and is left all alone, and so it stands to reason that the other final survivors also took out their respective scientists behind their experiments. As far as where things will go from here, we are only left to speculate what phase two means exactly. Though James Gunn says he does have an idea of where a sequel would go, should this one prove successful. My initial idea of where it would take the story is having all these survivors put into another facility and then through the next level of the experiment, basically forcing them to kill each other. It would be all the broken survivors fighting now having completely lost their humanity. It would be quite different than the average humans of the first experiment. And it would definitely be way more hardcore with these unhinged killers going at each other but what would that be trying to prove exactly? Or maybe they are simply trying to create killers out of average humans. But then in a different way, I thought more of the idea that the scientists behind the experiment specifically say they are trying to see what humans do without getting directly involved themselves. They want to see how humans behave without having much influence beyond setting up the circumstances. So maybe phase two isn't about rounding up the survivors, but actually leaving them alone and seeing what they do. Can they return to some kind of normal life after the experiment, or are they too damaged to ever fit into society again? Honestly, it's probably not possible to go back to normal after everything that happened, and who could blame them, really? All right, folks, there you have it, the ending explained for the Belco experiment. It tackles an interesting idea of how different people value others or whether they value themselves first. 
but in the end, it seems impossible to be the winner without also losing one's humanity in the process. What do you guys think? Would you be more willing to kill others for the greater good? Or would you do everything you could to save everyone? And what do you think phase two means exactly? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.